This episode is brought to you by the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. I'm Clint Bajakian and I'm a composer in the video game industry and I've got some background in sound design as well. I worked at LucasArts, then my own company Bay Area Sound, and then Sony PlayStation, and now I'm at Pyramind Studios in San Francisco. Hi, I'm Michael Land. I was the head of music and sound at LucasArts from 1990 to 2000, and since then I've been working on various software projects. Um, so when I started at LucasArts, there were about 30 people in the company. When I left, there was about 350. And over that period of time, that, that, that original core team, uh, uh, especially the project leaders, had this incredible um, just vision for pushing the envelope of what games could do. And so the audio and music people, myself being the first and then everyone else who arrived, was swept up in that vision. And of course, ultimately, it was, you know, the game team's um, reflection of George Lucas's uh, attitude toward filmmaking. So it, it all ultimately, you know, was, was working within that overall uh, ethic. And uh, the creative quality that myself and uh, Peter and Clint sort of established as a foothold when we started out, we really wanted to maintain that level so that every person we brought in individually uh, we really wanted them to have something really um, special to offer as, 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 a, as a creative vision uh, whether it, you know a lot of times it was in the in the sound design realm um, and uh, I think it was actually quite some time before we uh, before any of the other people who came in I think Dave Levison was the first to do some uh, some musical work uh, but all, but but the, the creative side of the sound design was just as important, and uh, so we basically said, let's bring in people who are who are sonically as creative as we are musically, and uh, we also wanted to make sure that uh, people had the ability to deal with uh, the vagaries of scheduling and uh, just the, the 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 amorphous nature of game development in the '90s because. The sands were always shifting, and so and, and 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 a certain mindset is required to be able to shift with those sands without getting flustered. And we developed a lot of uh, techniques, both to screen people. We did the bee test, for example. We'd bring them out to a picnic where we knew there was a hive of bees and see how they react uh, during a job interview, as one way of getting a sense for how are they going to handle this. And uh, we we picked really well, got a great team in, and then we developed a lot of techniques for. Um, managing the, um, the the shifting nature of the work so uh, just the whole the whole scheduling debate was a long and painful debate and there was never a resolution we, we were always you know in the middle of that dialogue but we managed to navigate it and keep things on track and and we never we never really badly <laughs> I have to laugh about this uh, we never held up a game release by more than a few hours I'll say it that way and that was rare. And that was, that was rare. rare. And that was rare. I'll, I'll, I'll tell a, a great story about, uh, you know, we were working on um, sound effects for a game and delivering them faithfully uh, in, a, in, a, in a steady stream to the audio programmer. Um, and this was back in the day when you really did need to, you know, they, they talk about throwing assets over the fence, right? We, we, there was really no choice but to do that uh, with the digital sound effects at one point. And uh, so we would deliver them and deliver them and deliver them. And of course, the producer was observing the prog progression of the game as far as how sonified it was and, and becoming increasingly concerned over a period of weeks and, and even months that the game remained on the silent side. And so, Michael, uh, we use databases, mostly FileMaker Pro, to track our work. And Michael suggested that I prepare a report for this producer, merely doing a set of finds in this database, how many sound effects have been uh, uh, have been spotted? Uh, now, of those, how many have been created? And of those, how many have been delivered? And of those, how many have been uh, implemented into the game? 
And, and up until the time where I prepared this report, there was tremendous pressure on me. Tremendous, it was growing amounts of pre really strong managerial pressure directly on me. I presented that report and the producer's gaze just gradually shifted over to the programmer whose responsibility it was to get these things into the game. So we had to really negotiate. We had to really, and it was always in a friendly way. Everyone was very friendly at LucasArts, but, but we had to really negotiate and carve out the space for ourselves, uh, not just in, in terms of uh, dependencies and delivery and scope and all those classic things, but what we found ourselves needing to defend most of all was our the, our own goals of achievement and creative achievement and technical achievement that we had set up for ourselves that relied on some degree of support from others, like the producer, like the programmers. And so we found ourselves having to go to bat and justify these things and sometimes using fairly strong um, methods of persuasion to, to create that uh, bandwidth for ourselves to, to achieve something that we viewed as special. Because we were all at LucasArts, part of the LucasArts culture was that everybody was achievement oriented. They, they had no intention of shipping a game as a, as a commercial enterprise first and foremost. The first and foremost goal was to create something that everyone was proud of. And second, it would be released uh, at, its, at the appropriate time. Once the creative goals had been achieved and, the, and it was holding water in the way that everyone wanted it to hold. And what this would cause, of course, is massive schedule protractions and, uh, and frankly, cost the company a lot more money than it bargained for going in with their initial schedules. Finally, after a few years of this, George Lucas came personally and gave a talk to the entire company. And he was very diplomatic about it. He explained something that, that he held as, uh, that he called the 55% rule. And what this rule was, was that you have a vision for something that you want to achieve. And of course, as a filmmaker or as an artist, you want to achieve it at 100%, no less. But you get the DP involved, you get the cinematographer involved, you get all the editors involved, you get the, the set designers involved, you get all the, you know, do dozens and dozens of people, at least in the world of film, involved. And of course, the logistics, you know, decrease your, your chances of hitting 100%. But he said, if you can hit 55%, which is clearly a number which is just over half, of 55% of your initial vision that the audience will get it. And that if the audience gets it, you have succeeded. It was his way of saying, come on guys, get your games up to a point where, you know, they, they get the point across that you wanna get across, but you don't have to be such perfectionists because after all, we're a commercial enterprise and we need to make a profit. So that was his, his message to us. Now, in the, in the audio department, I will say that we never adopted that rule and that we were always shooting for 100%. And essentially, we were never satisfied with anything less than 100%. Sure, we might end up with a 92 or a 94, but we, we, we would spend weekends and evenings and, and a typical work week was 60, 70 hours and, and even 80 and 90 hours uh, uh, for us because we had our own internal, uh, if you will, uh, microcosmic culture within the company that was, um, th that we were, we were driven by our own goals and ambitions. We always were targeting 10% of everything, uh, but you know the five to 10% range was, you know, we were happy with 10, not not as happy if it was five, and somewhere in the middle was okay, and uh, and that that worked out. I mean, we got certainly more than 10% of the um, sort of respect and and sense of of you know just sort of being part of what was going on creatively. So in that sense, we definitely got more than our fair share of the stuff that really matters. Uh, 
One thing I'll just say, say regarding that, which um, for me was a great privilege, which was for the first, I don't know, some number, five, six, seven years, for some period of time, um, I was included in the weekly project leader meeting in which they would discuss whatever their struggles and issues and visions were for whatever the games were that they were working on. And let me tell you, those were some of the most fascinating, most amazing discussions I've heard in my life about what games are. And to include the, the composer sound designer uh, person in that discussion was a, was a great nod from those guys. And that, that gives you some idea of the culture there. The, uh, the licensed products, mainly the Star Wars and Indiana Jones, uh, they brought with them a whole um, musical and sonic, as well as, of course, visual storytelling character tradition. And, and the mandate of the games group was not to just parrot what was in the movies, but to, uh, to take it somewhere. And so uh, certainly, Starting with the John Williams scores as a starting point, that gave us an incredible departure point. Uh, all of us had to kind of um, get our chops up on, on his composition style as, as best we could. It's, uh, you know, I, it's quite challenging. And um, so we, uh, you know, starting with that, we, we basically worked from the themes. We would start with his themes and a lot of the time, they were literally the things that, that provided the, the main structural points. And then to, to, to do some of the more um, interlude kind of stuff to, in the games that get you, gets you from one thing to another. Or in the case of action music, you know, he didn't write enough of a particular thing to have enough permutations to sustain an entire you know, game, for example. Uh, so we, we basically just worked really hard to learn his style so that we could derive things from it, spin things out, and still keep it at least, you know, uh, a, a, a clear shot close to what he did. Not anything, of course, of, of his sophistication, but enough that it worked. And that was a big success for us, to just make it work. I, I would add to that that, that uh, when in the early 90s we had so few resources in terms of voices for example so the the ad lib card or the sound blaster one card was capable of just simply two operator fm synthesis which enabled i believe we had how many vo simultaneous voices do we have nine something like six or nine so now how do you do a luca uh, uh, sorry a, a george lucas 105 piece orchestra with with nine voices well if at that moment the brass are playing triads that go da 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 well, you're in business. Now you can't overlap those notes very well, so it would sound, frankly, a little cheesy by today's standards. But that's what you would key in on. You would have to distill down any gesture. Well, let me actually rephrase that. You would have to distill down an entire orchestra's worth of content to whatever the most prominent gesture was. And, and if you listen to uh, John Williams, you, you, you will probably see that, that there's always some prominent foreground gesture at any one time. And I, I would say that John Williams' uh, uh, if you will, reverence of leitmotif and themes uh, is what we took our cue from and realized that we needed to get serious and uphold this value uh, for the Lucas titles, not only because they were Indiana Jones and Star Wars, which he had composed, but because he defined something that we viewed as classically trained composers as well, and people who appreciated classical music. Uh, we appreciated as the highest echelon of writing for picture. iMuse started out as a MIDI-based interactive music system, and it eventually uh, evolved to include uh, sound and uh, digital audio music, which uh, also, in parallel with that, there was a migration away from more low-level control up to a much more high-level uh, uh, graphical interface for the composer. 
Um, that very directly came out of uh, working on Monkey Island 1, The Secret of Monkey Island. Uh, it was a really fun game, and there were some really uh, cool music cues. Um, but at that time in the industry, the tradition really was to play a cue for uh, a minute or two, and then the, you, the player would experience a half hour, hour, two hours of silence, and then you get another cue for a minute or two. And uh, it just seemed like games could have a lot more than that. And so we made uh, the fairly radical um, commitment to, quote unquote, uh, when, when Monkey Island 2 came around the next year, to actually pave the game in wall-to-wall -wall music and in the process to uh, make the music conform to the gameplay experience as closely as we could. And, and those two commitments were really uh, the motivation behind iMuse. Yes, I, I would say that, that Michael envisioned uh, iMuse in the beginning and then uh, brought Peter McConnell aboard who really helped to shape it from, uh, from both creative and technical standpoint. And there, was, uh, there were more creative uh, and technical contributions over the years by people like Michael McMahon. But I came aboard and kind of functioned as the guinea pig where I, I was a layman when it came to programming, but I was a composer and a software user so many of the concepts and things like terminology were run by me for comment, which I appreciated. And uh, working with iMuse was, was an amazing, it gave a, an amazingly powerful edge over creating an adaptive score. After the commitment to make iMuse happened, uh, it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that there was more work to do to actually implement it than, than one person could do. So uh, I asked Peter McConnell to come in and join us, who, who I'd worked with a long time at Lexicon and uh, went way back with, we went to college together. Uh, and he came in and we basically took uh, the, the we split the low level and high level between us. I, I worked on the low level system stuff. He worked on a, on, on a tool that we called Q-Tip because the previous year there had been a tool called Earwax. And so we thought, well, let's make it, you know, clean up the sound a little bit. And so he developed that and that was essentially the environment, the working environment for the composer where you could create the music, assign all these hooks to it, and then you had a tool called Q-Tip to be able to click on things and listen to stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I uh, did electronic music at Harvard in the 80s and then got a master's degree in electronic music from Mills. So I was really uh, tied into a lot of the avant-garde stuff. But at the same time, the, 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 the motivation for bringing that into games really happened in a very, for me anyway, it was a, a very uh, specific moment working on Monkey Island 1 where there was some um, situation, I think it was the sword fight actually, where I had some pretty simple ideas for how the music should change during the sword fight, and there was just no way to do it with the existing audio system. And it was really solving that problem was what was the real impetus be behind incorporating all the flexibility we had for the interactive music. I think that all of us back then had, you know, obviously appreciated film and film score. And of course, it's a linear format where the music cue adheres to every frame of the film. And we wanted to see if we could achieve that in, uh, in a nonlinear uh, you know, domain where you really didn't know what would happen. You knew what would happen, but you didn't know when it would happen. And so to, to create structures to accommodate that, uh, I think, uh, if I may speak for Michael, because I actually, frankly, joined LucasArts just after the IMU system was really just coming online. I, I, the, 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 tr the trial and error was more of an evolution, an, an evolutionary process over 10 years. Um, the first round of the, of the specification that I wrote after Monkey Island 1, uh, pretty much that was the specification that ended up in the shipping IMU system. It, it, it didn't change that much then because we had a, you know, we painted a target and we built to the target and it worked really well, except it was unbelievably inefficient, unbelievably laborious between what the composer uh, would conceive of, the, the uh, specific system exclusive messages that the composer would then layer into the MIDI, and then all of the specialized instructions that the composer would communicate to the game scripter, and then all of the testing and iterating when you saw that things didn't work quite right, that you would do by going around that entire loop again every time you made a change. 
that became unbelievably inefficient. It was probably the least efficient game score that, that any of us ever worked on in terms of cost per minute uh, and man hours involved. But um, it certainly you know, hit, hit a nice bell that, that we then could try to uh, get back to in more efficient ways over the years. Uh, was sort of the most extreme extravagant place was Woodtick, which was, um, I think it was five or six or seven satellite uh, rooms off of a central walking area. And so the, um, that was a really good test of the system because we had these things called jump hooks, which, me which means you, you, you as associate a condition with a number, and then you pepper your music with messages that say, when you hit that number in this spot, jump to this place in your MIDI file. And so using that technology, it, it allowed the capability to have a different ending, uh, musical ending written for every single, I think it was every couple of measures, there was a different ending that was written. So when the, when the trigger came to leave the room and go back to the center, you had at most four seconds or so before the music would just suddenly take the turn and, uh, and sometimes it was immediate. I mean, it was great because, you know, a lot of times it worked out pretty fast. Um, where the music would just take a turn and it would be a composed, you know, classical music ending to a pirate tune. And, but different depending upon where you were. So that was a ridiculous amount of work. Uh, it was, you know, six pieces times, you know, each of them 30 measures long or so. And you have 15, 20 endings for each of those you're talking hundreds of little s snippets just for one little section of the game. And that was like, okay, we never did that again. That was just too much. And there's a number of things. And then beyond that, yeah, go ahead. Well, there's a number of, of things to add about that. Uh, for one, uh, Michael, who, who, who not only had, had spearheaded the IMU system, but actually wrote all the music for Woodtick and engineered and architected the whole Woodtick score, uh, had done such a good job, you know, that there's, there's different layers of, of work that need to be done. I mean, there's the music composition, uh, hey, for the barbershop, it's this music, and for this, it's that, and, and, and composing all that. But then there's the, the transitions and, and, and saying, well, if I'm in measure 14, I don't want that ending, so I'm going to have to custom write yet another ending that will transition back to the main loop of the, the catwalk that connected all these different locations. But not only that, there was the logic, and there was the, the uh, guarding against player exploitation. So if a player went in and out of the barbershop, you know, would they, would they cause the music to lurch and ping pong back and forth in an unattractive way? And the answer is no. There were all kinds of layers of logic that protected against the music doing anything uh, unnatural. And so uh, the punchline is that after all this hard work and all this, this benchmark uh, achievement, it was done so well that no one noticed. We got no word back from the industry or from the critics or from anybody that this was going on uh, because I, my theory is that it was so smooth that uh, it just sort of washed over everyone and no one noticed that all this was going on. So I've always, you know, had a sort of a, a three-pronged musical 
background, uh, rock and rock music where, you know, Grateful Dead, Hendrix, all that kind of stuff, reggae, love that. Uh, classical, uh, you know, Beethoven, Wagner, and, and a lot of the early Renaissance stuff. And then uh, electronic stuff, which definitely uh, tied into the programming side. So uh, really the, the wonderful thing about coming to LucasArts was that it tied into all three of those really well. Uh, and so the way Monkey Island emerged, uh, I mean, it's a hilarious game, really cool graphics, beautiful graphics. And uh, just one day I was home playing a, an organ patch and I came up with the chord progression and, and, and it sort of seemed to fit and I just built the rest from there. So it was a, a real uh, lucky sort of moment to, to, to have that fall into my lap at that point. Uh, but but even sort of more more broadly speaking, the 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 reggae pirate intersection that was really Ron Gilbert's brainchild, and and it really works. And so it, it you know it works thematically in the game, and and it and it just worked musically as, as well. The the English folk song and the and the and the reggae groove just went together really well. So it was actually a lot of fun and 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 very natural to spin out you know three four five games. Uh, that had that basic structure, and it and it opens up so many different cool little universes, or, or cool cool little, I would say, cool little spaces that you can explore. That uh, it's 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 very well defined and narrow, but it's also really open ended. So that was what was really fun about it. Great. Tying back to Clint's point about the film music model as the sort of impossible gold standard for, for this new environment. Uh, the, we, we sort of translated that down to, uh, in the first phase, these SysX messages that went into the MIDI stream, which were basically uh, you know patch dumps, but also uh, those are standard, but then jump hooks and part enable hooks were the two that we used the most. We also did volume hooks, but we didn't really use them very much. and and. These, uh, like I mentioned before, allowed a composer to uh, de decide musically what would happen in response to a change in the game state. Uh, and that was brutal on the game programmer because they had to get into our universe. So the next couple of rounds of iMuse, we, we worked hard to uh, create an interface between the game universe and the music universe, which eventually we settled on this uh, format of states and sequences, which were basically uh, states were things that would last an indeterminate amount of time, and sequences were things that would uh, intrude that lasted a determinate amount of time. And sequences could be short, like a second or two for some animation, or it could be long, like for a whole cutscene. And uh, we came up with a tool to uh, allow the composer to um, put buttons in a, in a window that represented all the states and sequences that they wanted the game to be able to control so that then the composer could uh, exercise the score, the interactivity of the music score by pressing these buttons. And that really made things much easier because uh, that became the, 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 the fence between the game world and the music world. And you could look at that fence as a composer clicking the buttons, but then when, when it went into the game, you knew it was gonna work. And uh, things got a lot easier after that. And I will say that this has been something that the game and the, the game audio community has been lusting after for decades. And we had it in early '90s with with Michael and Peter's uh, IMU system, where you 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 could not only author your score but you could test it. And another another thing about it too is is that in the MIDI domain you had much more control over. Uh, a much higher granularity of parameters. You could bring your cowbell in slowly or bring it out uh, gradually. Um, and a perfect example of that is in Monkey Island 2, the approach to the uh, voodoo lady's lair, which was that sort of elevated skull above the swamp. Um, Michael uh, uh, programmed that so that as Guybrush's rowboat gets closer, parts within the music gradually morph uh, at their own rates to gradually uh, transition the piece to another piece. In digital audio, even to this day, that is very difficult to achieve because you'd need to have all of those separate digital streams running simultaneously off of the disc. So it was a very interesting time in that with, ironically, with MIDI, even though a perhaps a, a lower level of sound quality uh, back in the older days afforded 
a, a great amount of, of, of discrete control over the different elements that made up the music. I would also add that the, uh, the IMU system in general was a system that was, uh, that was very powerful and when it transitioned to digital audio streaming uh, in the mid to late 90s um, was, was a very sophisticated uh, audio engine. But it was designed and, and programmed and deployed by composers. And what this enabled was an interface that was user friendly to a composer. This is something is still, for me, from my vantage point looking across the industry, is still fleeting, is still the elusive goal is to how to come, how to deliver power to the hands of a person who may, whose primary skill may be sound design or music composition, but not programming and not controlling complicated applications. So it was, and, and in my opinion remains, at least for now, the most powerful tool for adaptive music authoring that has existed in this industry. And it's interesting to think that, especially when we're talking about the 1990s. I would say that one of the things that contributed to uh, the discontinuation of iMuse, and also with the caveat that I can't comment too clearly after the time in 2000 when Michael, Peter, and I all left almost simultaneously, exactly how or if it was even used after that point. But what I can say is that Michael and Peter and to, to a large extent, Michael McMahon, who is a, a, a music programmer in our group. Uh, without them, there really weren't the custodians of, of the software and of the system to, to sustain it. Last, if, please. Oh, I was gonna say, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, one of the things about the system is that it was designed by composers uh, for about five years, and then it really did start to get into you know, more serious engineering requirements with more and more drivers required. So we brought in Michael McMahon as a programmer and he took over the, the, the low level audio programming tasks and the amount of sort of effort and attention, then we, you know, continued to build on the higher level stuff. The amount of effort and attention for something like that, at least for the time, was always a source of tension within LucasArts. Uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't clear how much it was contributing to the bottom line of games sold. And it's really, there's really no way to quantify that. So there was always, you know, some people who had a sense that it was really a big part of the Lucas identity. It was worth the investment. Uh, but you always had to guard against the concern that, uh, you know, in a, in a situation where, where, where budgets are looked at carefully, it's hard to justify. So uh, we managed to justify it for <laughs> a decade or so. We're pretty proud of ourselves for being able to do that. But I think part of that, a big part of that, was the incredible talent of the team that, that collected around it and was, was working with it and producing great results. So there was such a, a positive benefit overall from the creative talent that the technology managed to uh, sort of ride that tide. I'd say in the 90s, we were spoiled by iMuse. There's no question about it that we had a tool that, that even throughout the 2000s blew anything away that was out there. Uh, and, and we all, many of us would get together uh, at, uh, regularly at conferences and sessions and panels and lectures and essentially gripe about the lack of tools. And if you looked at, at, at tools uh, developers like Cakewalk or Mark of the Unicorn or, or, or Avid, uh, Digis Design and, and others, uh, they really weren't in a position to want to take anything like that on because the market just wasn't big enough for them. And so we kept continuing on without standardized tools that would, would and of course the entire goal was to uh, escalate a composer's and a sound designer's ability to shape audio without having to have programmer skills and to be able to test their scores and their soundtracks outside of it within the confines of their own authoring environment so that what they were delivering was known and that the tools were roughly user-friendly that was the goal 
Well, it just kept eluding all of us until finally we now have some really great middleware solutions in FMOD and Unity and WISE. And, uh, but, but still there was no holy grail, at least in my opinion. The holy grail was to unify the, the content authoring environment. No one can compete with Cubase or Performer or, or Cakewalk or Logic to say sequence a, a piece of music in MIDI. No one can compete with Pro Tools to work, uh, to work with multi-tracks of audio. Um, so that if we call that the content authoring environment, then you have the integration environment, and then finally you have the game engine. Well now, just recently, I've heard about the integration of Nuendo with Wise. And I was speaking with Simon Pressy at Crytek, who said that now they've tied that into their Cry engine. That's the first I've heard of what sounds like, at, at the very least, the beginnings of the Holy Grail, where you're in an authoring environment and an integration environment and the actual game uh, runtime environment uh, fluidly, simultaneously, and can tweak in any of those areas on the fly. So finally, we're, we're really getting there in 2015. Okay. For me, it was a great pleasure because I had been hired full time. In 1991, I was hired as a contractor and I lived here in Marin County and, and worked on Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis and Monkey Island too. And then there was a, a, a brief pause while I went back east for a while. And when I returned, that was the hot project is Maniac Mansion to uh, Day of the Tentacle. And what was so inviting about that project was this kind of jaunty Danny Elfman approach to the music. Very comic, very comedic, but also very uh, rooted in um, responsible, skilled writing for a pit orchestra, for the kind of pit orchestra that might be in a, in a, in a vaudeville play or comedy. Um, and so we, uh, Peter, I would say led the charge on, Peter McConnell led the charge on creating kind of some germ uh, themes and, and approaches to those sorts of textures. And then uh, I actually completed the main theme uh, for the intro, uh, intro sequence, which was just a great uh, pleasure because it's, it's a big long thing, as you know, the car driving through everything. And, uh, uh, and all three of us contributed uh, equally to the entire score, and I think we broke it up mostly in terms of the past, present, and the future. Yeah, that's right. I'm trying to remember how we broke it up, but I'm thinking that you might have been the future? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think Michael was the future, and I was the past, and Peter was the present, okay. if I'm not mistaken. And, and of course, you, we, one of the things that we discovered in, in Maniac Mansion Day of the Tentacle was the power of looking to film score greats like John Williams uh, or uh, Ricard Wagner. I mean, you know, the, the notion of, of leitmotif and the notion of attaching a theme to uh, a specific character or a specific, in this case, location in time, or in the case of Monkey Island, to a particular island. Etc. And having these multiple themes all be uh, be available to draw upon to to create um, uh, derived material and and that created a, a cohesive score. So one of the great themes is Hoagie's theme, and Hoagie was the big the big rock and roll uh, fan, you know, with the long hair and the backwards baseball hat. And uh, I think Peter wrote that theme. But the idea was to create these leitmotifs and these themes so that there would be cohesiveness in the score. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was one of the qualities that helped distinguish the LucasArts scores back then. Another quality that uh, I think distinguished the scores is uh, starting with Monkey Island 2, definitely with Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, Day of the Tentacle. At, at that time, we developed a, a, a real um, set of interlocking compositional styles where the three of us uh, you know have uh, a lot of um, uh, the, the three of us have a lot of different compositional voices that 
in some cases overlap, but they're very distinct and they each cover, each person covers areas the other doesn't. So as we got to the point where, and just naturally because we were friends for so long that we could uh, come to a game score and just sort of intuitively know, you do this, we'll do this, I'll do this, you know, we'll, I'll start this and then hand it off to you. And all those kinds of maneuvers just happened so effortlessly amongst the three of us while we were writing these scores. And the scores really show it. They have this integrity where you have three artistic voices just blending together in ways where it's, it's the, the seams are really hard to tell where they are. And it just works very well. And I've never actually experienced a, a, a three-way composition collaboration like that in any other situation. Um, this, uh, this score had a, a really nice overlap between um, some musical feelings that I've carried my whole life and the uh, emotional content of the game, which was about uh, being away from home and wanting to get back to home, and, and the longing for home, but also the strangeness of a new environment. And uh, it just, uh, you know, for me, I didn't have to look for, for, for the musical language. It was really just a matter of pulling it out from myself. Um, and part of the uh, part of the way that, that I facilitated that I, I was I got the rights to use snippets of Wagner, which uh, what I did is I went through a two CD set of a bunch of his uh, music and isolated out moments where he had, uh, wherever he had a chord that was sustaining long enough that it was kind of a stable chord for just a measure, or two measures, sometimes three. And I had maybe, oh, I don't remember, was it 800 of those little snippets? eventually and uh, and so I then I was able to compose a score using big fat lush Batman strings on the K2000 and for each moment of the music that seemed to call for it I could just grab one of those snippets and blend it in underneath as a kind of orchestra or orchestration trick really I mean his his orchestrations are so amazing and those textures are so rich and the music I was writing was slow enough that I could just layer that in, almost like pouring in putty. And that really helped give it a lot of depth. Um, but the, uh, the other sort of central aspect of, of the score for The Dig was the harmonic language and the harmonic space, which really came about from the central sort of, I guess it was a, a subway area, of sort of a tramway area, where it was a circular walk around circle situation with a bunch of doors, I think it was seven different doors. And so you could walk in either direction. You couldn't just, you couldn't crisscross. You would always be going left or right. And I realized that that could map to a chord progression, which if it worked right, which, right meaning it sounded really good in either direction for any of the two, for any adjoining chords, they sounded great going in either direction. And, and I worked really hard to come up with seven chords that worked that way, forwards and backwards. And that defined the harmonic space of the game. And the rest of the game was sort of built off of that, uh, rep, roughly following the, the architecture of the game universe itself. So it, it really did, the music really did map very well to, to, to both the emotional undercurrents of the story and the geographical space of, of the game. So having completed the, the score for the game, which is, you know, three hours of music or two, two hours of music, something like that, uh, I had the opportunity to release a, a soundtrack, uh, which, you know, 45, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, something like that, and so in a, in a mad scramble during seven weeks, I, I basically composed a 45-minute song cycle based on uh, the themes, the, some of the main themes from the game. And that was a real eye-opener because of the fact that linear music, it was the first time in that, really as a professional composer, that I had done linear music where it just goes in one direction and you didn't have to think about all of the different possibilities all the time everywhere you went. So that was, that was, that was really cool in one way because it, it allowed me to really maximize the emotional thrust by, because I, I, you can really focus and it's going here, so make it go here really well. Um, at the same time, the other eye-opener was that 
it was a 45 minute piece of audio which uh, had you know short second or two long breaks between 12 pieces or so and it was really hard to get 45 minutes of music into your head all at once where you could really feel the whole thing all at once and and you you know working on things in segments obviously is a, is a practical necessity but I really tried to as much as possible as 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 it was sort of as all the pieces were coming together, to really experience the whole thing as one gesture, more like a symphony and less like 12 individual pieces. I'll just tell a little bit about this, the Sony story, because it's kind of interesting and I'm, I'm sort of proud of it. it um, in 2004, I worked at my own company, Bay Area Sound, and I was at E3, of course, looking for work and asking Chuck Dowd, who was the music director at Sony, if maybe there was something I could demo for, et cetera. And he said, well, no, not right now, but there is this position. And what we're trying to do is get someone in who will help lead and sort of spearhead a new beginning in how we approach our original scores. And at that time, he only had two people who were engaged in production. And one of them was sort of from a licensing background, and one of them really handled more of the sports titles in San Diego. But there was no one such as myself who came from a LucasArts background and was, was very familiar with creating a, a large-scale narrative orchestral scores, so, or original scores. Uh, and so our talks led to me taking the job in 2004, and one by one, two by two, we built the department together. Uh, which w people who ultimately were learning from a tradition that I had brought from LucasArts about how to approach scoring games, how to approach interactivity, how to approach the, the dramatic aspects and the dramatic requirements of scoring a game, especially those with a story. So my first game was God of War, where because we hadn't staffed up yet, I served as a one-man music department. Uh, I made phone calls to seven different composers, and I only had four months to do the entire project, really three months. Uh, and in that time, uh, there were times where I spent the night at the office. Uh, I played the game and learned every level and determined how the score needed to work in that level and identified which characters and which locations needed to be treated specially thematically. And I would also map that uh, character or location or theme to one of the specific seven composers as far as who had the voice that would best cover that. So it was a lot of communication and direction to the composers. They really didn't need to know too much about the game other than what I was telling them and I was trying to make my descriptions rich. And, and uh, they delivered all the music to me and then I did all of the editing and the, uh, provided all the instructions to the programmer and did all the play testing of the game to, to, to verify that the music was working correctly. That was God of War 1. By the time we did God of War 2, we had a team of about 12 people. We were recording live orchestra in Europe. We had a team of editors. We had uh, a redundancy at the music direction level. Uh, and by the time we did God of War 3, we were up to 18 staff and something like nine editors. And so, so grew the Sony music department. The, these sorts of approaches have been carried forward to the Uncharted franchise, to the Infamous franchise, where essentially it's all based on passion and it's all based on leveraging the technology for every inch it's worth and lots and lots of communications and collaboration, both on the development side and also the creative team side of often composers and orchestrators and musicians who were hired outside of the company, of course. Chris Velasco was one of the composers, Gerard Marino, uh, Ron Fish, uh, Mike Regan, uh, on the first one, Winifred Phillips, on the second one, it was just the four, and then on the third one, uh, we added Jeff Rona as well. And so we just had this whole team, and uh, if anything, there's this theme that runs through everything that we've been talking about, 
where in LucasArts, we had a team of composers in, in uh, Michael, Peter, and myself. In the Sony years, on a, on a project like God of War, we had a team of composers to spread the wealth. They each had their own respective voices, and that led to success, both in terms of uh, having variety and stretching out the, the palette of sound and style, but also achieving cohesiveness through care and deliberation um, right up to the point where in in just the last year we scored Warlords of Draenor and once again Russell Brower led a team of composers the same thing yet again so there's a theme I think that runs through all of this that that really supports the notion of multiple composers working closely together and leveraging the variety of their voices well, that's a great question about choir and the use of choir. Certainly, it factors into the God of War uh, soundtrack quite a lot. And that, and that was something that was uh, designed at the outset of God of War, uh, that it would not only be orchestral and heavily, heavily percussive, but that it would also sometimes have this choral um, you know, surge above, above the orchestra. And that would be my point, is that, is that the way I look at it anyway is that when we look back at primordial times, what were the origins of music? What, what, what is the real core of musical expression? And if it wasn't some caveman banging on a log or something, which it may have been, you know, sort of the first instances of music, it had to have been the human voice and the, the utterance and the vocalization. Another thing about the human voice is that when, unlike with an instrument, when we... Uh, when we go higher in pitch, we actually exert more energy. And so a lot of times in a more actual human physical energy that originates from our chest and our diaphragm, which is where our heart is, which is where the very core of our being is physically. And, and so it, a lot of times in opera in an aria, you'll, you'll begin the, op, uh, the aria or at some particularly climactic point in the aria, there will be a large melodic leap. And, and that's precisely for just one reason. It's because the, the person is struggling more and straining more to, to reach those heights. So we hold our hand up and we shake our fist at the heavens and we, and we look upwards when we, when we consider the choir surging up and singing high and, and stridently above the orchestra. So it really, to my mind, is the most emotional tool at the composer's disposal uh, not to take away from all the other instruments, but when the choir rides on top of the orchestra like a wave, it's, it's like a tsunami of power. And so I think that's one of the gravitations towards it. That said, it can be overused and it can be cliche and one has to be very careful about when uh, uh, and, and what sorts of genres and scenes and situations it's used in. I think that uh, it's a great question to talk about how the composer team treated uh, Warlords of Draenor is just a great subject and, and essentially it comes down to the, the, the excellent leadership of Russell Brower who is the senior audio director at Blizzard and of course the chief uh, the, the lead composer on the Warcraft series for many years running. And of course, there were, be, in addition to him, six of us. There was my, you know, myself, Sam Carden, Neil Acri, Ido Guidotti, Emer Noon, and Craig Stewart Garfinkel. So it was a large group of seven of us with Russell at the lead. And his technique as a leader was very simple and in its simplicity was a great deal of power. And what that was is to give us some artwork, give us a little background story, and then say, go. Go have fun, go express yourself, and I'm not gonna give you any more direction than that. To him, it seems the farthest from what he would want to do would be to micromanage or to try to over-direct your various creative moves or, or even assign to you, hey, Clint, you know what? I want you to do a cue based on this location. He wouldn't even do that. Now, in God of War at Sony, that's exactly what I did. I would say to one of our composers, 
please write a cue based on this specific place and make it kind of like this. This is, a, Russell gave us the freedom to essentially strain the subject matter through our own personal filter as six different composers reporting to him to, I think, in, on, speaking on his behalf, to leverage the richness that results when you have different people with their different backgrounds and walks of life and perspectives filtering and straining the same common source of, sor of source material, the story, the art, the characters, the locations, through each of their own respective artistic souls. That what he came up with was this somewhat calculated, I think even, uh, rich, a uh, stained glass window of variety that all worked as one in the end. And I think it was no accident because he was so careful in who he selected and, and how he uh, communicated to us to, in between the lines of his, of his uh, very sparse direction, a lot was being uh, gleaned by each of us as for, his, uh, as for his hopes for what we would come up with.